So thank you for the intro. Um, as it says, I'm going to be talking about distributed configuration with Nomad. Um, this is a project, a research project that I was working on recently. Um, and I wanted to talk about it and share it with you because we felt that we found Nomad fit quite a nice niche in which we, we basically replaced using a systemd in its system with Nomad. Uh, and so a little bit about myself. I am a distributed systems engineer. Um, I have a background in infrastructure and ops, um, not kind of a development. Um, and I've spent most of my life on call. Um, and I think because of that, I generally tend to automate that 20% that kind of gets forgotten about. I don't like having to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, having to restart the service, or having to just twiddle that little tool to make sure it works. Um, and as introed, um, I've created a couple of Nomad tools um, for the community. Um, Sherpa is an auto-scaling tool. Its primary use is to auto-scale uh, Nomad jobs, either using an external webhook or an internal auto-scaler. Levant is a deployment and uh, templating tool, uh, just to provide some kind of developer help. Um, and Nomad Toast, um, not named by me, um, is a notification tool that can take kind of deployment actions or allocation changes and stick that into Slack for you. Um, and I did ask my girlfriend for an image of me. Um, could have been any actor, you know, musician, someone handsome. Um, she picked Butter Scotch. So um, I had either that or uh, Father Dougal. So uh, I went with Butters. And so let's get into this, the final talk. Um, and I'm going to give an overview of what the architecture looked like. Um, this is probably one of the worst infrastructure diagrams I've ever written. Um, very nice and simple. But this kind of illustrates it quite well. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got the Vault cluster that we were using for secrets management. Um, and it's important to understand that the console here is used only for Vault backend. This isn't used by Nomad. Um, I'll get to the console for Nomad in a little bit. In the middle, we've got the quorum of Nomad servers. And then kind of on the right is just this whole kind of computes layer. This is different types of servers with different configurations. Um, and this was all bootstrapped using Terraform. We used the Libvirt and the Vault providers. And then to actually do the config management, we were using Bash scripts, a bit old school. Um, but we didn't really need the full-blown configuration management deal. We didn't want to have Ansible, Puppet, CF Engine, whatever you wish. Um, and it was just doing a minimal install. And this is what we got to. Um, and we, did, we could bootstrap that in eight minutes. Um, and discussing more about that bootstrapping process is a bit kind of out of scope for today. Um, but if you're interested in it, come and find me later, and I'll be happy to chat about it. And so what are some of the considerations um, when we were coming up with this architecture? Um, so we do have the secure and segregated console and vault cluster. As I said, we used it for PKI and for secrets. This might not be possible for everyone. If you've got cost constraints, anything like that, we were running on physical hardware. Um, virtualizing using Libvirt. And so that made sense to us to keep that kind of whole portion separate. Every server um, was running a Nomad client, even the Nomad servers themselves. Now, I think I remember you reading it a year ago. Um, I could be wrong. One of the Nomad team can probably point me out on this one. But they advised maybe not to do this. Um, because if your Nomad clients are using all of the resources or a lot of the resources on that server itself, you're actually going to starve the Nomad servers, and they're not going to be able to do their job. Um, you can get around this. So the Nomad client configuration has a resources uh, parameter. And so you can actually reserve resources so Nomad won't schedule onto that. Um, and we also did this because it's, it's nice to be able to run maintenance tasks, reporting tools, any management. On all, across all your cluster just using Nomad. And so that was one of the primary reasons we did that. And on that kind of whole pool of workload, um, we used um, meta, meta parameters and class parameters or class values for the clients themselves. Some of the workload we were running was very hardware specific. And so we had to ensure that a particular job, a particular batch workload was placed on a, a particular server. And using the Nomad meta, client meta, we were actually really able to make uh, just this general pool of workloads 
was what it seemed, but be highly flexible in where we were placing things. Um, and that was the bootstrap phase. And so from here on in, it's everything managed by Nomad. Um, there we go. I'm just going to grab some water. And so what were the first things we did after, after the bootstrapping process? So during bootstrapping, we used this small Go application, Go process called Goton. And that was providing um, proxying between the Nomad servers and the clients and the Vault cluster. Um, has five stars on GitHub, but worked for us. Um, and there might have been quite a long time between bootstrapping and the actual use of the cluster, so we just left this in place to provide connectivity. Um, but we would stop that, and we would stop that using a batch job through Nomad. And then we would start Fabio. Um, we're a big fan, well, I'm a big fan of Fabio. Um, and we were using that with traffic shaping to provide access to Vault from the rest of the environment. Um, and the last one, so this is where the console for Nomad comes in. And we run it under, under Nomad, um, the console server as a service job, and the console clients as a system job, because we wanted that everywhere. I kind of had a bit of a love-hate relationship with doing this. Sometimes I'd look at it and think, why the hell am I running console under Nomad? Um, but actually having Nomad run manage console, restart allocations if we needed to, was actually quite nice. And we preferred, in the end, doing that than running console on the servers as a binary themselves. Um, and so the top code snippet is um, the template section from the job that was stopping Goton. Um, it's not pretty, very pretty. This was an early example of that. Um, and all we're doing is embedding a, embedding a bash script within the template section, running this as a batch job, and it will remove and stop the Goton binary. The console uh, code block there, um, if you're familiar with console, this is just writing a KV. And this was done at bootstrap time. Um, and it's basically telling Fabio that when you're coming to route traffic to Vault, um, just put 100% of that traffic to anything, the service with the active tag. And Vault acts quite nicely in updating console if the active node changes. And so this was a really nice way to actively ensure that we are routing to the correct node. And the final snippet is from the Vault config file. And this is just telling Vault that when you register with console, put these particular tags into your, into your console service registration. And you'll notice that we're using the proto of HTTP. Um, that's because we were doing SSL offloading at the Fabio layer. Um, and that's to do with the whole bootstrapping process. Um, how can Vault itself run with TLS if Vault is providing with TLS, unless you have some seed cluster somewhere? Um, and that was a lot nicer for us than running HA proxy. Um, we struggled with HA proxy to the point where three of us had to look into the HA proxy source code, and that was not a fun day. Um, and so TLS management. So some of this might actually be defunct after this morning's announcement. So I might look back at this in a couple of weeks and go, what the hell was I thinking? Um, TLS does take a long time to set up. It was difficult. Um, but it was something that we wanted quite urgently. Um, and even having TLS certificates with a, a TTL of 10 years, so you could have just one cluster that sat there, Vault cluster, you generate a 10-year certificate, and you put that there and run Nomad using that, for example. Um, that wasn't the proper answer for us. And so we use short TTLs as default. Um, we did that from day one. So that was both on infrastructure applications, such as Nomad, such as our database. But that was also on all of our internal applications. Um, and some of our smaller applications, some of our maintenance tasks that ran for minutes, for seconds, they would use um, low TTLs. I think the lowest is 15 minutes. I could be wrong on that. Um, and the highest one we had on the, across the whole platform was 722 hours, um, which is 30 days. And as I said, this took a long time to get stable. I think I got asked by my manager, mm, what do you think the likelihood of getting this in after we built everything? And I told him it was pretty impossible. And to help manage the, the low TTLs, we wrote a small application that would initially perform TLS expiration checks. So you would be able to pass a threshold in days, and it would go, it would check the certificate it was pointed to, and it would tell you whether or not it was going to expire. We later added IP SAN checks, 
This allowed us to actually bring in more servers into the cluster, and we could just trigger this job, and all the TLS certificates in the, in, in the cluster which were affected by these IPSAN changes would then update this, their um, certificate. And if either of these checks failed, Cert Manager would go off to Vault, request a new certificate, grab that, and put it on disk. And then we would run any arbitrary command, anything you want, um, which would then force that TLS certificate to be updated and be changed. Um, and we used this process quite successfully for everything that wasn't managed by Nomad. Um, and we also had things like built-in jitter to avoid thundering herd. We also exposed structured logging telemetry so that we could monitor TLS certificates in exactly the same way that you would want to monitor any of your applications. There were some downsides, as always. Um, it used some interesting deployment logic to make sure that all nodes of a particular class had, their TLA, had the job run on them. We were effectively replicating system batch. Um, please. Um, it wasn't hugely problematic for us. This was because we weren't in a cloud provider, so we weren't having all these ephemeral nodes that were coming in and out. We were running on TIN, and so the members of our cluster were not changing particularly much. Applications that don't support SIGCUP reload, I had to restart through that mechanism. And no matter how good the automation is, I always get a bit squeaky when I have to, when I know one of my applications is performing a restart at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so if you're ever writing applications, please always plan for TLS reload via SIGCUP. Um, and picking Nomad as an example, you may have TLS on the API, but you also have downstream TLS connections to console and vault, for example. So being able to reload those is quite important. Otherwise, you're going to have to restart the application anyway. So I put bundle splitting in because we did it this way. And I'm not actually sure if this is a decent way, but this is how we did it. Um, so when Nomad is requesting um, a TLS bundle from vault, it uses console template. But it comes as a, as a full bundle. Um, you get the private key, the CA chain, the certificate in there. Um, most applications don't accept a bundle. Um, we did write our internal applications to accept a bundle there. So one way we got around that was that. And the application itself would then split the bundle, load it into memory how it wanted to. Um, but for things like our database, for things that we didn't control, we used this Harry Henderson GOM plate. Um, I keep looking at that and thinking I'm saying Harry wrong, but it is Harry Henderson. Um, and we use that to perform the splitting magic that we needed to get these bundles into their component certificate private key. Um, and this is a very top section. Um, there was a lot more than that. For anyone that uses console template, you'll be familiar with the, the first section. Um, we're just requesting a certificate from Vault. Um, and we're actually piping that to JSON so that we've got the JSON representation of that bundle. The second is where GOM plate comes in. Um, and so if we look at the data within the template, we're effectively printing out from the bundle the private key of that JSON. And we're, laying, and we're writing that template file uh, to disk. And then this is where it gets maybe a bit sketchy. Um, to, when we were running the applications, we actually invoked GOM plate as the primary application to run. The minus D is specifying the data source, so in this case, the JSON bundle that we want to take in as our data and split up. The minus F is the actual template file to process, so the one that was written uh, in the previous slide. And the O is the output file, the, so the rendering of that file. Um, and then we can, at the bottom, we can call the application with those split files out. And so this worked quite well for us. Um, we actually put a few fixes into Gomplain itself to make sure that signals were handled properly and propagated to children. Um, but this is one of the things that, if anyone knows a better way, please tell me, because that would be great. If not, this does work, and this was pretty solid for us. And so now I'm going to move on to CockroachDB. Um, I, I'm just curious, does anyone run databases on Nomad or Kubernetes? Sweet. I'm not the only one. Good. Um, so for those who don't know what Cockroach is, it's a distributed SQL with horizontal scaling. 
Uh, it provides location partitioning so that you can run global clusters. Um, and it is cloud native technology. So if anyone is playing buzzword bingo, there you go. And I'm going to start this section by quoting Sir Kelsey Hightower, as he should be called, um, who spoke at HashiConf in 2016. And he, he said that most people get really excited about running a database inside of a cluster manager like Nomad. This is going to make you lose your job, guaranteed. I still have a job, so this isn't exactly true. Um, but I still do believe this is true for most traditional DBs. Um, and that being said, if I had something like AWS RDS available to me, I'm probably going to use that instead of trying to maintain my own database cluster on a scheduler. But counter to that, more modern DBs like Cockroach, like TyDB, I think it's become easier and, easier and safer over the past few years to do this. Um, and to a point where we run this happily uh, as our main data source in this project, um, without too much trouble. But even when we got into trouble, so we had a, a moment when the TLS certificates may have, may have expired on the Cockroach cluster. Um, and even by doing some manual intervention and some kind of funky ha hacks onto the cluster itself, we managed to bring the cluster back up. And it, we didn't lose any data. It was there. It was fine. And so it proved to be quite resilient. And so what, how did we set up the cluster? Well, we had servers placed across hosts using constraints. Um, this ensured that we had HAM redundancy. We used ephemeral disks as well. Um, so if any, anyone's not familiar with what ephemeral disks are, they, we had it set up so that it would make a best effort. If an allocation failed, it would be put on the same server, the same physical host that it failed on. This meant that only the local and the data directories had to be copied across disk. It was a lot safer. It was a lot quicker. Um, and we found this to work really well. It also worked really well when doing deployments and upgrades of the cluster. Cockroach requires uh, an initialization, just an init command to be run. Um, and again, we used Nomad to run this as a batch job. This was all part of a pipeline, and we could trigger it from our deployment tool. And one thing to always, that we always did was we Always paid, we pay careful attention to everything, of course, but um, we pay careful attention to the job parameters in Cockroach, and we kept analyzing to make sure that we had timeouts set right, that we had different standards configured correctly, so that we, we knew what we were getting into if something failed or if we were doing a deployment. And this is how a couple of the bits of the jobs looked. Um, the top left is the actual DB cluster group section. Um, you can see the ephemeral disk using Sticky. Um, we're using a count of three um, and the distinct hosts to kind of force this to go across a number of hosts and not all bin pack onto one. And the constraint there is just an example. This was to make sure that this wouldn't run on any hardware that was better suited to running another type of workload. The second box um, is the init command. And this job really, apart from pulling some TLS certs from, from Vault, this was all the job did. It would run in less than a second, and it just makes sure that it initializes the cluster on the first run. But now you've got a cluster. What do you do with your schemas and everything like that? So we, we stored our table schema alongside our application code. Um, and we, we wrote a small application that was used to apply the schema changes. Um, it used this Go Buffalo Packer. Um, and the schema change was effectively an up or a down file and just included things like create database, create table, alter table, drop table. Um, and we had the up and down so that we could roll back any problems that we encountered. It was also item potent um, so that we could, we would often, when we triggered a full deploy of any platform code that had been built, we could deploy all the migrations and we would ensure that we've got the latest changes. If there weren't any changes and they'd all been applied, then the code would just go through it anyway and we'd be fine. We even had a command that we could seed data for development purposes. Um, again, this was run through Nomad as a batch job. And this was perfect for any integration testing, uh, for local development, and also for doing demos, so that we could get some data in, bring it all up, automated, and we could go. So backups. Backups are probably one of the most common batch workloads to run on Nomad. Um, and the periodic stanza um, within the Nomad's batch job template um, 
allows you to configure the backup jobs to run to meet any SLAs you have. So you can set it to run every minute, every hour, every day, however you need. Um, and we use this mechanism to back up our cockroach DB tables as well as our co console um, nomad cluster and our vault cluster. Um, we wrote thin wrappers around the cockroach dump command and the console snapshot command just so that we could control a bit better some of the naming when we put that file up into our external storage. Um, the application also had a restore command. Um, if anyone remembers reading or did read the GitLab outage, um, then this is kind of relevant to there. Um, a backup isn't a backup until you've tested that restore works. It just isn't. Um, and so we have, the, we have the restore command for two reasons. The first is so that we can test it quickly. The second is that when you get into that DR situation, you're not kind of trying to stumble through a process that you're not familiar with, running different commands that you're unsure of. Having this ensures consistency across both the backup and the restore. And with this in place and with the automated bootstrapping, you can build this platform in 15 minutes with a full data recovery. And so everything is code, works nicely. And so just a few miscellaneous points that I wanted to bring up. So these don't really kind of deserve their own section, um, or I just didn't find anything as interesting to say about them. Um, but ingress and discovery. So as I mentioned, I'm a big Fabio fan. I've used it for as long as I've used Nomad. And we used Fabio to provide external access to all of our services and our UIs. Um, we added HTTP access, um, style access to Fabio itself, so you can secure UIs. We also added gRPC access um, features to Fabio. Um, and the UIs, so this is the kind of console, the Nomad Vault UI. Um, and we actually ran community UIs instead of the official ones. Um, we actually liked the idea of being able to, to constrain where the UI ran rather than be dictated that it ran where the API was. Um, but this was just one of our personal preferences. Um, for service discovery, um, again, this is probably a bit old since this morning. Um, for applications we didn't maintain, um, we use console DNS service discovery. Very easy to plug into to applications. For our internal code base, um, we were running gRPC services. So we used the gRPC console resolver. Um, and this worked brilliantly. It was 30 lines of code to hook it up. Very simple and worked very nicely. So part of production. So this was something instilled in me by one of my old managers. Um, and it's something I still quite hold dear. Um, and so that entire platform, the entire infrastructure, the entire process could be built on my local developer machine that I have in my house at home. We were using the exact same processes, all the same tools. Um, and this was really nice because it actually allowed us to even, even test the infrastructure processes. We didn't have to push our code and then see 30 red jobs in Jenkins before we figured out that it's a typo. Um, and this was really important in having this path to production. All of our deployments as well, we use TeamCity. We use Levant, which I explained and described earlier. And we use Nomad Toast. Again, Nomad Toast is running on the Nomad cluster. And this gave us better automation. This gave us better observability about what was going on. And despite being a research project, we did have monitoring in place. Um, we used our own application again for this, very small. Um, but we had a console health checking service that would then use the health checks to alert out to Opsgenie so that we can get woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning. With that, we also shipped all our logs to Humio um, using a Filebeak shipper. Proved really good. Um, we use kind of the log shipping pattern that is described in most of the reference architecture. Um, we were running just a log shipper per server. Um, and we found that to scale fine. Um, and we ran that as a system job without any constraints. And with that, it means that it will just run on every server, every client in the, uh, in the cluster. Um, and now just to wrap up a couple of final things. And then we can all go and enjoy the lovely Amsterdam evening. Um, from the bootstrapping phase, once that was done, we used Nomad to manage 
everything, and I mean everything. We even had particular people building Nomad jobs which would install packages on the underlying hardware. And relying on a single mechanism for running these tasks, for me, simplifies the whole process. It ensures consistency, um, and it also lowers the barrier to entry. If I have someone in my team that is more of an out-and-out -out developer, who, who doesn't know Terraform, who doesn't know Ansible, who doesn't know Jenkins or things like that, and doesn't know Nomad, in this, in this environment, all they would have to do is learn a little bit of Nomad, even just the little bit that they really care about, which is the config and the command. They can get my help or someone else's help, and they're configuring their, their instances or they're running their application code really simply. It's true we did write a fair number of small applications um, to help with the tasks. And this isn't to say that any of the tools we were using was bad. Just this really helped us smooth any edges out and streamline the process. Um, and it made, for me, a platform that was very easy to deploy, really easy to maintain, um, but actually was also very solid and worked very well for us. And so I'd like to say thank you. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. And if you've got any questions, I'll see you out there.